Well, welcome back, beloved, to our online platform. I trust you've had a blessed week and you are excited for God's word for you today. Let us pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for that. It's your will that will be done, Father God, in our lives, Lord, regardless of all the circumstances, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for all the circumstances and trials that you have brought us through, Lord. But Lord, we ask for your help and your guidance, Lord. Lord, use this word today, Father God, as a tool for transformation, Father God, and as well to place us on the right pathway, Lord, that we will honor you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's get into it, beloved. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, please go with me to Matthew chapter 25 from verse 1. Amen. Matthew 25. Hallelujah. God's word is really awesome. So we are anticipating a mighty move of God, even while we are sitting in our lounges or wherever we find ourselves today. Amen. And it reads as follows. You can follow in your Bibles. It says, At midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins around, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Amen. So being rapture ready is a personal thing. You cannot give someone else the responsibility of making you ready. No one has the responsibility of making you rapture ready for the coming of the Lord. It is your responsibility. Being rapture ready is a mental preparation as well as a physical preparation. We often forget this aspect and often think that our being rapture ready or ready for the coming of the Lord is just a mental state of mind. But now you have to also be ready in terms of what you are doing physically in the physical manifestation or the way you live out your walk with God. Amen. And it continues, it says in verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. After the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. <laughs> Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. To be ready is to live ready. I'm going to say that again. To be ready to meet your Maker is to live ready. Being ready is not a thing that you consciously prepare yourself for. And when you're on your deathbed, now you want to make yourself ready. It's a part of your life. If you say, I'm ready to meet my Maker, it means I live a lifestyle that constantly places me on a platform to be ready for the coming of the Lord. Hallelujah. So your Christian life is a preparation for eternity. Preparation for eternity. This life that you are living on this earth currently is a dress rehearsal, as some would say, for what's going to happen in heaven. If you cannot worship God here, I doubt you're going to worship Him there. If you do not value his word here, what's to say you would value his word there? Am I preparing for eternity or for earthly living? Now, your actions from day to day is preparing you for one of either of those things. It will either be preparing you, you're getting up, you're sleeping, you're everything that you are doing. It will either prepare you for your day to day living, things in life, or let me put it this way, for the world. Or it will be preparing you for eternity. So take stock of what you value and what you prioritize. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you future and a hope. Hallelujah. This is such a powerful word. This is such a powerful word of God. And it's something that you would often find when you are wanting to wish someone well for their birthdays. And this is the verse that often comes up, Jeremiah 29, 11. But do we understand what this verse actually means? The, the manifestation of this verse in the life of the modern day believer is often absent. Because we think quoting the verse 
gets us the power. Quoting the verse brings the manifestation. It has nothing to do with that. So reading something doesn't guarantee that you will take hold of it. For instance, reading about a new product doesn't mean you will necessarily take hold of it. Let's say, for instance, you would like to purchase a car, you would like to purchase a new phone, uh, whatever thing you want to purchase, reading up on it doesn't guarantee you will get it. You know this is true because what does the reading do? It prepares you mentally. Remember, in the beginning, I mentioned that being rapture ready is a mental preparation as well as a physical preparation. So using that particular analogy, if you would go and buy something right now, you've obviously seen it, seen the ad or seen something. So you've seen it, but it doesn't guarantee that because I've read about it, that now all of a sudden I can expect it. There's certain things that you need to do. There's the practical aspect. So if you want a new phone, reading up on it on Google or the catalog of uh, whatever cellular magazine, doesn't guarantee it. So I have to begin to prepare myself. What does this preparation process look like in terms of this example that I'm using? So if mentally preparing myself is reading up on the ad, the physical aspect of this thing is now getting my finances in order because I physically have to get things. I physically have to work hard in order to get that. I physically, if it's a big appliance, I have to physically move things out of the way before it comes. I have to make my measurements to make sure this thing will fit in. It's a physical aspect of it before the thing manifests right in front of me. So an adjustment is always required in order for me to take hold of any promise of God, any promise, any promise that you can find in, in God's word, any promise, there's always an adjustment. Something has to change. There's a quote that says the only thing that is constant is what? Change. You're right. Change is the only thing that is constant in this world that we live in. Change is the only thing that you can count on. That will happen. Change must happen. Today will not be the same like tomorrow. The way I look today, hopefully, will not be the same way I live tomorrow. Change is constant. Your every faith-based interaction should lead you to an opportunity for change. This is why the gathering of the saints is so important. This is where your church life comes into play. And by church life, yeah, I mean the four walls of your church. The reason why you go is not because it's Sunday. It's because you are positioning, remember mental, physical, because you are physically positioning yourself in the church. Now when the word of God comes from the pulpit or the man or woman for, of God, now you will begin to mentally digest it. So be, between the two of these things, between the, the mental uh, um, projection of the word, as well as you physically placing yourself in that seat, brings about change. But it has to be a mental preparation. You cannot go to church with a desire of wanting to be changed. But the only reason you go is because it's Sunday. So whether it's a church service, whether it's reading your Bible, any faith-based interaction should place you, if you allow it to, it should place you on a platform of change. Even a spiritual post on social media. I know many of you have seen quite a few posts in terms of Facebook and WhatsApp statuses where it's an encouraging word of God. If you allow it to, that word of God will change your life. It will bring about change. But the change can only happen if you embrace the change. Or even listening to a song on YouTube, beautiful worship. It does not need to be just a melody that you listen to and you enjoy. It can bring about change in your life. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 says the following. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. I want to read that again. Such a such an awesome word. Uh, Therefore, we do not lose heart, for even though our outward man is, not, not the, the tense in that verse, is perishing, my outward man is in a state of perishing 24 hours a day. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So as Christians, we are in a continuous process of change as the rest of the world is as well. But as for a believer, the change has more depth. The change has more 
purpose the change ushers and places us on a platform of power renewal is the catalyst of change you cannot want change if you don't want something new I'll say that again. You cannot say you desire change. I'm praying for change. What is change? Lord, I I don't want this. I want that. That is what you're asking for. You're asking for change. You cannot pray for that or expect that, but you don't want the new. The Bible says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? There's an important thing that I will mention now. And if you miss this, change will always be kept at bay in your life. Always. And this is the thing, inward renewal, are you listening? Inward renewal will always precede outward renewal. Inward renewal will always precede, in other words, it will always come before the outward renewal. So you desiring things, breakthrough for this, uh, things you trust in God for, that is an out, that has to manifest outwardly. But before it can manifest outwardly, something needs to happen inside. Now we have it mixed up. We have this tendency to think that when breakthrough comes, it's first going to manifest outside. No. There's a spiritual world that we live in. Everything physical is built upon a spiritual principle, a spiritual uh, foundation. So in order for your breakthrough to come to fruition, you have to realize that it has to happen in me before it happens to me. So how do I position myself? I'm going to give you six pointers in terms of how do you position yourself for, for change? Because it's a position. Some of you have the mental thing going. You have the Bible verses placed in your room. You have the prayer life going. Come on, come on, here we go. You're praying and you're trusting God. That's the mental. But physically, there are certain things that is lacking. I'm going to show you those particular things. First thing, how do I position myself for God's change? Number one, be committed to your change. In order for things to change, you must change. This is not optional. Often we desire change in our family, in our careers, in various areas, but we want the change, but our hidden little thing we add to it is, Lord, I want you to change this, but I don't want to change. And most of the time, the thing that is in the way is us, and we are blaming everyone else. So let's say, for instance, for those of you who are not in your pajamas, those of you in your pajamas right now, that's, that, that is fine. Those of you who've actually gotten dressed and all of those things. Okay, for those of you, when you go out, what, you, what happens to you? You go through a process of change. You change this outfit, then you put on that outfit. Uh, ladies, I know, take quite long when they do this. They have five, six outfits before they, they actually choose the correct one that they want to have. But there's a process that they go through. You cannot say, I want to look nice, but the change mustn't happen. I, 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 I want the outside to, to, to change. <laughs> so in other words, um, I expect to look nice, but I don't want to change the way I look. I don't want to change my dress code. I don't want to change what I have on. If somebody told you that, you would look at them very strangely because it's just not possible. If you want to look good, you need to dress yourself good. It's the same thing when it comes to spiritual change in your life or changes in your faith. It's the same thing. So you cannot desire something different without accepting the responsibility of change. Do you know that your change has a responsibility? And the responsibility, it's yours. It's not the pastor's. It's not your mother. It's not your father. It's not your boss. The responsibility is yours. It's not even your friends. It's your responsibility. So am I committed to change? Or do I just like the idea of change? Some of us are praying earnestly and seeking God's face or have this desire for certain things in our life. But nothing has happened. It's been a couple of years or a couple of months and still nothing is happening. And we're wondering what is the problem? Could the problem be, just hear me out, could it be that you don't necessarily like the change? You just like the idea of it. Now the idea of it will never position you to a place where you take responsibility for it. When you when you like the idea of change, you will stand in the position you've always stood. You will stand in the mess that whether you realize it or not, and you will demand change. You will think change must come. 
but it just doesn't work that way because you like the idea of it. Some people like the idea of marriage, but not the commitment. So the same with our walk with God. Second thing, we must be proactive, whether you are saved or not saved. Life still happens to you. You're not living in a spiritual bubble. The same thing as the Bible says, the same rain that falls on the unrighteous falls on the righteous as well. So in terms of being proactive, the lack of preparation often leads to emotional decision making. And this is where we cut the very crucial umbilical cord to our breakthrough and our change. Is that because we are not living in a state of readiness uh, even to embrace the change that we so desire, when something does happen and it often will, we end up making an emotional decision that severs the process of breakthrough and places us right at the beginning again. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, we see how the enemy comes at very strategic points. Now, I'll always mention this when you look at the areas of attack that the devil mentions and how he presented to Jesus. One often looks at it. If you didn't know that particular verse, if you haven't read it before, you would look at it and say, wow, this is actually quite reasonable. Uh, These things that the enemy is, is offering, the devil is offering, it looks quite reasonable. But Jesus, was, he didn't make an, an emotional decision in terms of keeping the enemy at bay. He was prepared. He knew that because I'm being sent out to, to be tempted, that's what, that's what the Bible said. The Holy, he was led out by the Holy Spirit to be tempted. So he knew he was going to be tempted. He was prepared in every aspect, mental and physical. Every aspect. Number three, you need to fight for your change. It's your change. You want the change. You need to fight for it. Change will not happen when you lie down, when you sit down, when you give up. Change happens when you are tenacious about it. This is my walk with God. I desire that breakthrough. This is mine. I know it is mine. You need to fight for it. If you don't fight for what you want, don't cry for what you've lost. You must have a willingness to do whatever it takes. Whatever, whatever, whatever it takes, I am going to do it because that's how committed I am to this breakthrough, to this change. Embracing change is like stepping into the boxing ring. Have you seen boxes? It almost looks like some of them before they get into the ring, they already built up a sweat because they in the the, the background beginning to warm up. Why do they warm up? Because I'm ready to fight. Because I'm because I'm 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 ready to do whatever it takes. If you want to knock me down, you're gonna have to do your best. Imagine we have that attitude towards our breakthrough. Imagine we have that attitude when the enemy comes knocking and wants to steal our joy and what is rightfully ours. Imagine we stand firm and say, You want to take me out? You're gonna have to try everything. But I am not going to take this lying down. I'm not going to retreat. I'm not going to surrender. I'm going to fight you till the very, very end. Imagine we had that attitude towards the devil. Some of us have that attitude when it comes to food. (laughs) When it comes to social things. Now we want to fight for these things. But when it comes to your walk with God, you were like a civilian. You were not wanting to take up the, 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 the battle at all. You are giving in to the enemy, but when it comes to worldly things, you hold on to it with everything. It has to be swamped around. It has to change. Those who are committed will always see a bend in the road as a change of direction and not as the end of the journey. When you are committed, even though your road takes a turn, whether you've anticipated it or not, but you see the turn coming, you see that simply as a change of direction. When we ask God for something and God delays, somebody who's committed doesn't take God's delay as a denial. They just take it as there's certain things that I still need to fix. That's why it's not coming. But somebody who's not committed, ah, the Lord didn't come through. It's only been a a week. The Lord didn't come through. I'm giving up on this. I'm going to go into the world and try and get whatever I can out of the world because God's not working for me. But if you're committed, you will know. Oh, that hasn't happened today. I thought it would, but it's fine. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. Let us trust in God. Number four, 
attach goals to your change some of us have these brilliant ideas these inspirational ideas of change of how we're going to conquer this how we're going to do that we, we, we place it on our statuses we place it on facebook when others read it they are inspired but a year down the line nothing has happened that thing has still not been fulfilled what is the missing key goals we have not attached goals to our change the bible says that you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling that work out your own salvation is often a verse that people don't like because don't tell me i must work <laughs> i must in the in the world i have to work now when i come to my faith i must work as well but you need to work it out why what is this working this working entails that if i have a certain spiritual goal for my faith a certain goal for my faith for that matter i have to attach goals i want to increase in my prayer life well then you have to change your schedule you have to put in things into in, into place i want to be more committed to god how are you going to be more committed it's nice saying that but how are you going to be committed to god i i i want to be more on fire for god how are you going to do that put practical steps in place that will ensure that you will get there saying it doesn't mean you're going to get it for instance you were saying i want to lose weight say it with me i want to lose weight quickly go get a scale go get a scale has your weight changed anyway some of you don't even bother because you know already you have common sense and you know just because i said i want to lose weight it does not influence the scale so why do we not understand this principle when it comes to our walk with god and when it comes to change, I cannot just say things loosely and expect that things will just happen. I have to attach goal. Number five, position yourself for change. You can't pray for breakthrough, but reject change. Because breakthrough will come on the platform and the appearance of change. Some of us don't know what we're asking for. So how do I position myself practically? You know, I like to be practical. It's not you speaking deep things, but you don't understand it. When it comes, you don't know how to take this and apply it to your life. So what do I practically mean by positioning yourself? So you have certain uh, goals and things that you would like to attain for this particular year. Am I right? Or this particular month or this particular week? Or there's something you don't like in your life that you know needs to change. This is how you do it. Friendships. There's certain repositioning of friendships that you need to, some friends you need to say hi, and some need to say bye. How is my current social circle contributing towards God's plan for my life? Do I feel closer or further away from God after spending time with my current friends? How has my current social circle contributed towards my failure or my success? And if the friends that you have, if you're choking it up more on, on the failure side as because I'm with them, I can directly link this failure and that failure because I was with them or my association with them. You need to make a change. What other things do you need to change? Lifestyle, habits. Can you imagine an alcoholic wanting to change, but he doesn't change his friends and it doesn't change where he hangs out. So he still hangs out in the same place with the same people. But he has an expectation that I'm going to be delivered from this alcoholism. Your mindset needs to change. There's a lot of stuff in our lives that we, because of this particular breakthrough that we so much desire, uh, we are in the position that we are because of this, because of the way we've thought about this particular thing. That's the only thing that has kept us from attaining what we're supposed to attain. So you need to renew your, your mind. Romans 12 verse 2 puts it beautifully. It says, do not conform to the standards of this world. And how do you not conform? By renewing your mind daily, not weekly. A Sunday service or watching this once a week. This is the only time you encounter God's word by watching this particular teaching is not enough. It's not enough. Daily, you need to renew your mind daily you need to be filling your mind with stuff that you actually want so if i want this i need to i need my mindset needs to align in order for me to get this i can't desire something there but i'm sampling from here my speech needs to change speak in line with what you have faith for not what you see the bible says that we we as believers we walk by faith and not by sight that automatically should tell me 
that when I speak about something, I don't speak what I see in the natural. I speak about what God has placed in my spirit. That is what comes out of my mouth. Most of us are on autopilot. We trust in God for something. But then when the negative comes, oh, we confirm the negativity with our words. Ah, you see, it's always like that. Ah, no. Oh, I see this, but Lord, I trust in you. Oh, this, oh, that happened again. But Lord, I trust in you. I know that this will change, Lord. Lord, I put my hope in you, even though the things is not changing. I put my hope in you. Be like a Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel was praying to God, but he was still in the lion's den. But did that keep him from praying? No, it did not. Do you know what you are entitled to as a believer? Isaiah 43 verse 19 says, For I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. Listen, through your wilderness, God is making a pathway. Not ha- not, is, not is, is busy. He is making it right now. You need to perceive it. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. God is speaking to you today. He's making a pathway through the wilderness. He's creating rivers in your dry wasteland. We often don't see or acknowledge the change because it progresses at a speed that is different to ours. When we expect something, especially in this generation, the microwave generation, I want it now. You spend two minutes too long in a McDonald's line and you become fidgety and the world is going to end and you want to see the manager. That is the day that we live in and we approach God with the same expectation. I just prayed, uh, Amen. Oh, where is it? It's not your Lord. Something, something is wrong. It's, it's no. Wait upon the Lord. What does waiting on God mean? What does trusting in God mean? It means having the confidence. This is what trust is. Having the confidence that God knows when the best time is. So nature does not hurry. Look carefully. I like watching Natural Geographic and these particular nature shows because it teaches me a lot about my life. And the reason why it does that, because who is the author of that? Who is the author of nature? God is the author of nature. So you want to see the character of God? You look at his creation. So nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. Nature is chilled. Nature doesn't, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that. Nature, everything just happens. It's like a a process that just flows so nicely. Can we not learn from that? Nature is governed by seasons. Currently, in South Africa, we are in our winter season. But none of us throws a pity party. None of us throws out all our, our summer clothes and, and, and starts to barricade ourselves up and, and prepare ourselves for a, a year-long winter. No, we know. It's, a, it's just a season. I need to just get through this particular season. If, I don't, if I'm not a, a, a person that likes winter, I just need to make sure that I get through it because it's not going to be here forever. It's the same with life. Life is filled with season. No season should last forever. The only way it does is if you bring it with you from month to month, from year to year. That's the only way it will last forever. So the fact is, we change our clothes to align ourselves to this particular weather. So if, like I said, if it's, it's, it's winter now, so what do you do? You don't go out when it's raining with a shorts and a tank top. No, you don't. You look outside, oh, I don't like the weather, oh man. But what do you do? You simply go to your cupboard and you change, you adjust yourself so that you can function in this new season, in this cold. You put on your jacket so that you can function. So why is this not done with regards to our relational and 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 spiritual decisions when you are when you see oh i'm enjoying the summer and all of a sudden winter comes upon you in your in, in your faith why did you simply adjust your dress code i'm not speaking about your physical things i'm speaking about the things in your life simply make adjustments in order to get through the season some of you are in difficult seasons uh you have been praying to god for something god has heard you but this is a difficult season you are in don't give up simply adjust we learn from all of god's creation the birds why do you think the planes are designed in the way that is because from the birds we learn the laws of aerodynamics from the trees we learn the effects of seasons today there's leaves tomorrow there's not leaves but the tree doesn't give up oh my leaves are gone no it knows it will come back again we learn from that 
The Bible refers to learning from the ants, <laughs> the importance of hard work. So there's certain natural things that we learn. Life lessons we learn from nature. So everything in nature functions in accordance to its purpose because it embraces the cycle of change. You are in the process of change constantly. I mentioned earlier, nature is also in a constant process of change. I love gardening. I love gardening. Now, the thing about gardening is I, I, I love that I need to look after these plants. When I have, I purchase a new plant, it has to be watered every so three or four days. Certain plants like their watering every day. Certain plants, you cannot water too much. But when I come out today, let's say for instance, I come out today and I look at this particular plant and I see it again three days time, the leaves have all of a sudden changed. It's all of a sudden bigger. There are new shoots coming out. Did, did I have anything to do with that? No, it's an automatic thing. It's the, that plant is in a constant process of change. It's a natural law. Everything on this earth is in a process of change. So what about the butterfly? The butterfly is such a beautiful, beautiful creation of God. But a butterfly starts off as a caterpillar, which is born from an egg. Why did God just, have you ever thought of this? Look at the butterfly and you know some of, or most of us who've gone through schooling, we've gone through the, the metamorphic uh, cycle of the butterfly and we know the processes that needs to happen. Have you not often wondered why did God not just simply make the butterfly to be the butterfly and skip the entire process of the caterpillar life? Why? God is trying to teach you and I something everything god does is strategic the creation of the butterfly that whole metamorphic process is for you and i don't resist change be like the butterfly a butterfly is the result a butterfly is the result of a caterpillar that has embraced the cycle of change if a butterfly had its own free will uh, or a caterpillar rather and it decided i don't want this change i don't want the cocoon I it would never ever become a butterfly it would remain a caterpillar but the presence of a butterfly the physical manifestation it simply means that that was a caterpillar that was committed to its change. Change is available to everyone. You don't like the circumstance you're in, change is available to you. But not everyone is willing to embrace the change because a change comes with certain responsibilities attached to it. We love the butterfly, it's beautiful, but you cannot reject the caterpillar, but yet you love the butterfly. The two are connected. What am I trying to say here today? Is that some of you are in your caterpillar phase. Some of you are, you're looking at yourself, you desire to be a butterfly. Or in certain uh, circumstances, certain areas of your life, you know it's supposed to be designed as a butterfly. It looks beautiful, but it doesn't have that. It looks like a caterpillar. Some of you are in your cocoons, but don't reject it. It's a part of your journey. It's Jesus had his cross that he needed to bear. Daniel had the lion's den that he, he needed to contain with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego at the fiery furnace. That was their caterpillar. That was their cocoon. Joseph had the pit that he needed to deal with before he got to the palace. Everybody that God deals with goes through this process and seasons in life. But don't abandon the process. Appreciate each phase of your life. Wherever you find yourself in, and you know what the best thing that you can do for yourself is often this? What do I mean? Don't be so overwhelmed by what you see others having. And you look around and you see it's not in. And I, I don't have that. Who's to say that God wants that for you? Who's to say that he doesn't want better? Who's to say that he will position you to a way that you don't even need that and you will have more fulfillment than the one that the person that you are uh, looking at and desiring that particular thing. Second Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Are you a Christian? It means you have become a new person. And this is what it means. The old life is gone. Your old life, if you are a Christian, 
your old life is gone the old way you used to think the old things you used to do your old habits it needs to be put aside it must be gone in order for your new life to begin verse 18 and all of this is what it's a gift from god why are you saved are you saved just to have the banner of christianity hovering over your head Oh, I hope that you were saved because you looked at your life, you sampled the world and you've seen that something is just missing. And I want to know Jesus because I want that abundant life. I want to know Jesus because I want a life of fulfillment and a life of purpose. If you want that, you need to let go of what you currently have. So all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the stars of reconciling people to him. Your life is a des design in the way it is. Those caterpillar phases, those that cocoon phases. It's giving attention to your life so that when you become a butterfly, people will marvel at what you look like now because they know the struggles you have faced yesterday they know what you looked like yesterday yesterday you looked like a caterpillar and now look how you look and when you what gives your life that that the testimony is now when they look and they say how did this happen now when you say jesus now the name of jesus carries power because they can see the manifestation of it as long as there is breath in your lungs you are in a process of transformation don't give up. God has not given up. He will never give up. You do not give up. Your new life or season is dependent on your willingness to leave your old life and season behind. Don't give up. You are a butterfly in, the, in transformation. Your cocoon, I know it's tight. It's, some of you feel lonely. Uh, you feels like you're the only one going through it. That's just your cocoon phase. It's not the final you. Don't give up. As long as there's breath in your lungs, you will accomplish. God is faithful to see that you become who He has ordained you to become. Don't worry about the voices of man. Don't worry about the opinions of this world. Allow God Allow God to be your strength and your guide. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the person that is watching this right now. The person that is going through so many things. The person that has so many questions, unanswered questions, Father God. I speak to the person who's at the point of giving up, Lord. And Father, I ask that you come through for them in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you that your will be done in their life in Jesus' mighty name. And I thank you, Father God, that as your kingdom come and your will be done, Lord, I thank you that they shall experience your abundant life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance towards you and give you his everlasting peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.